I want to talk tonight about uh, a different approach to cooperative organizations, uh, which is happening in different countries, um, but it's not so well known um, within the cooperative sector necessarily. Um, in some countries it certainly is. Um, and beyond the cooperative sector, it's hardly known at all. So, um, so I'm sharing with you some, um, some ideas um, which we wrote up in the book, uh, which we produced last year with my colleague Mike Lewis. But also, um, I, I've been trying to see how these ideas could apply to the UK in two particular areas. One is in relationship to ecological economics and environmental businesses, um, or ecological businesses. And the second area is in relationship to care services, whether it's caring for young people with kids, or whether it's caring for older people, disabled people, or uh, resettling offenders, leaving prison. So kind of a wide range of, of things. OK, so I've called the talk um, Building the Democratic Road as We Travel. And I think it'll become clear as, as I present this evidence uh, why I've chosen that particular title. So in the book, The Resilience Imperative, um, we, we developed this idea of the cooperative commonwealth, which is a very old idea, and it goes back a couple of hundred years, but it's an idea that seems to be only refounded when the economy really gets bad, like the current crisis, like the stagflation of the 1970s, um, like the 1930s, you could go back to the 1890s, 1820s, 1840s, when you have a big depression. Um, countries that have industrialized and are suffering um, rediscover this idea of the cooperative commonwealth. So it's, it's a vernacular idea, and it's very important to understand what it's about, but it's central to the longer-term vision of building the cooperative economy. And in these days, building it closer to home, decentralizing the economy. So in the book, we look at four basic areas of need, um, food, energy, and shelter. We also do look at care services in one of the chapters, but not as in-depth as, as these particular topics and needs. And we also look at key functions. So we, it's about a kind of a cross-weaving because the cooperative commonwealth concept is about cooperative organizations that are cooperatively owned, whether it's consumer cooperatives or worker co-ops or multi-stakeholder cooperatives. Um, but the cooperative commonwealth uh, idea is beyond that. It's also about land reform, and it's also about reforming the financial system. So there's, 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 there's three or four dimensions to this particular approach. Uh, the talk I gave in March, which you can have a look at if you're interested, was called um, Fast, it was the Earth Talk, it was called um, Fast Money, Slow Capital. And it's actually about cooperative money and cooperative capital. Was anyone here for that? Nobody? Okay. You were? Yeah, okay. So I'm not going to be talking about cooperative money, cooperative capital tonight. Um, but if you're interested, you can look at that Earth Talk because um, you can pick up that particular part of the story. This is a very interesting observation made by a man called Louis Kelso, who developed, he, he, um, I'm from California, this guy spent a lot of time in California and San Francisco, and in the 50s he developed this way of transferring a corporation from the private sector into an employee ownership system, so actually moving it from you know, investor ownership into uh, worker ownership or some mixture and it was called employee share ownership plans, and they've developed systems to do this. But this was a lawyer, a banker, who invented the system. So I thought he, had, he, he encapsulated very well in this particular quote. The Roman arena was technically a level playing field, but on the one side there were the lions with all the weapons, and on the other side were the Christians with all the blood. That's a slaughter. <laughs> and so, and so it is a slaughter to put people into the economy without equipping them with capital, while equipping a tiny handful of people with hundreds of thousands of times more than they can possibly use. And that's really the situation today, very graphically. Okay, Occupy in New York, making the point about the 1% and the 99. 
But if you look at the facts and figures, it's obscene level of inequality um, globally. I mean, you, you, even the French Revolution before wouldn't have had this level of obscene inequality. With 300 billionaires owning more wealth than the bottom three billion citizens on the planet, and 500 corporations accounting for 66% of global GDP. Um, whilst on the other hand, you've got, if you like, lions, dare I say Christians, 3 billion micro enterprises globally, um, who are basically creating most of the work on the planet. Most of the employment in the planet is created, in, created by self-employed people. If you go to India, the micro-business sector is the majority of the economy. And in developing countries, that is still the case. But even in the UK, and this is very widely not understood, um, the self-employment sector and the micro-business sector is really the salt of the earth. Something like 25% of jobs in this country are supported by one- and two-person businesses. They're below the radar screen um, of the Department of well, it's now, now it used to be called Department of Trade and Industry, now it calls business, um, biz, business and industry and science. Um, but they, they, you know, they, they, they are, there's a lot of votes in, in, in the micro business industry. And if you actually look at areas of the country, the amount of micro enterprise depends on where you live. So in a lot of inner city areas, the micro business sector is larger than it would be on the national average. In rural areas like this, it is higher still than it is in the national area average. So it, you know, the kind of dependency of the economy on very, very small businesses depends on where you are. I live in Mid Wales, and it's got the highest level in powers of self-employment in the whole UK. I mean, people doing this job and that job and the other job. But, in fact, in the 19th century and in others, this century in other countries, it is actually the self-employed people who created the cooperative movement. You know, it was the bakers and the people that went fishing, and it was the farmers, and it was, it, it, it was people doing kind of traditional jobs and traditional areas of work and craftsmanship that created the cooperative movement. Uh, because they had to. They simply had to. Farmers had to because they were being ripped off by the banks and the railroads and all sorts of other people who were rack-renting them. So we have this situation of massive inequality with power on one side and numbers on another side. What might a new uh, economic paradigm actually look like? There are lots of solutions, without question. Schumacher College has been talking about um, umpteen solutions, really, since, it's, since the beginning. Um, alternatives exist and are ubiquitous pretty much everywhere, um, but they're dispersed. Um, they're quite small in scale. Um, they're often local. They're doing good things, and for the people that they're reaching out to and supporting, they're very important. Paul Hawkins, in his one of his recent books is called the, the, This Particular Invisible Economy, um, The Blessed Unrest. Is it possible to actually make these dispersed units of activity that are actually, you know, like the nuts and bolts of the economy um, and the social economy, um, to enable them to become stronger and much more uh, evident and, 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 and uh, more politically powerful? Uh, that's an important question, I think, strategically. How is it possible to fit the jigsaw pieces together? Well, that's what I want to talk more about. Mutuality and cooperation do have the, the answers to that question. Um, they always have, um, and sadly, that's uh, frequently forgotten. So we're seeing at the moment a resurgence of these ideas, and people are more interested in cooperative um, activities than they have been in the past, and I can produce evidence which I'll show, share with you in a minute about that in the UK. Micro change agents need to think um, of how to connect mutually. Can we connect these circles? Um, historic struggles to build cooperative commonwealth provide the guidance on the how to do it question. 
Interestingly, John Stuart Mill wrote The Principles of Political Economy in 1852. Um, it's a very big book, about that thick. And um, book four is the book where he made his forecast that the economy could achieve a stationary state where it would stop growing. At that point in the future when it stopped growing, what we would be concerned about is not making things that were materially evident, because the technology would actually have got to a point where that was pretty easy to do. But that should be much more about developing human beings, you know, good work and what they really want to do, whether it's play music or guitar or, or sort of, you know, uh, you know, sculpting or whatever they wanted to do, just enjoying themselves on the beach. That the concept of good work, of livelihood, would actually become the norm rather than what you do at the margin of your working life. And he was a cooperative economist um, because the, the, the way he saw we could achieve the steady state in that particular book four in the Principles of Political Economy was it through different forms of cooperative organization. And he put a heavy emphasis on worker co-ops because he thought the difference between worker and consumer co-ops, it was actually much more engaged. It was not a passive activity. It was much more an engaged activity. So he put an emphasis, he, you know, he was certainly for consumer cooperatives, but he, he thought that um, people uh, who were working, taking control of firms and organizations was the future. And so I love this quote um, because it talks about the concept of making um, democracy a part of daily life, like baking bread or going for a walk. It, it, you know, democracy becomes not something that's rationed every four years and you have to choose between these days it's seemingly Tweedledee and Tweedledum, but actually um, uh, you are involved in, in democracy, your, your daily life um, is, is actually, uh, that, that, is, that is, you walk the talk. So we do not learn to read or write or, or to swim by merely being told how to do it, but by actually doing it. And so it's the practice of popular government on a limited scale that will teach people uh, uh, to exercise it on a much larger scale. So here's a quiz question. <laughs> what do these current images from across the UK have in common? Any guesses? Yeah, they're alternatives. What are they doing? Absolutely. And what are they trying to do in pursuing cooperative activities? Any ideas? Exactly. They're trying to raise money cooperatively. The number of community share issues has been growing quite healthily so from just a very few uh, a decade ago to now more than 100 uh, a year in the last two years. Um, and that's because, you know, as the austerity, as you can see from 2008, kicked in, the mutual aid began to also kick in. And where you do get market failure, you find historically, when times are scarce, that people begin to help each other again and you get this solidarity economy beginning to emerge. It's almost you know, like wildflowers being able to kind of, um, you know, because the soil is not so rich, uh, it, you get the wildflower effect. And in fact, these are figures from Cooperatives UK's um, Community Shares Unit. Um, the number of issues of shares in the UK at the community level is now about to exceed the number on the stock exchange. So we're actually having, not raising anywhere near the amount of money, of course, and I'll show you those figures in a second, but actually the numerical numbers of issues is, um, is beginning to challenge the city of London. Yes, these are all, the, these are all industrial province societies, either bona fide cooperatives or um, uh, uh, cooperatives for community benefit, uh, mutual benefit societies. So here's a breakdown of the figures. So over 300 new uh, cooperative societies 
uh, were registered and set up in that three-year period between 2009 and 2012. Over 120 share, uh, share issues uh, completed, 21 million raised from over 20,000 20, members, average offer per share issue of approaching 200,000 pounds, average membership attracted 200, and the average investment approaching 1,000 pounds. So pretty good, actually. Um, and you can actually see also the areas of concentration. So uh, one of those photos was, a, was, was I think, a pub. Um, uh, so that's a popular area. But also the rescue of rural shops um, and other community facilities in rural and urban areas. And renewable energy accounts for almost half. Things like community land use for community support agriculture um, is, I think, the orange uh, wedge. So that's actually... Uh, a growing section, but it's, it's, it's a more marginal area at the moment. Hopefully that will change. I can't remember, to be honest. I, I could, uh, I should, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sport would be one. Yeah, and certainly, um, this is an interesting one that relates to sport. So football clubs... Um, cooperative ownership of football clubs has been a very popular activity area as well, and that will have been probably the fourth one on that uh, pie chart. Uh, the number, as you can see, of, 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 of pubs being um, bought by the people, um, <laughs> great, isn't it? You know, returning pubs to the public um, is, is growing um, very, very strongly, um, especially... Um, in many, many parts of the country, very popular. Tim mentioned the one in Bristol that you'll be going to, I think a number of you going to uh, at the weekend uh, when you go up to Bristol. Um, here's um, another uh, one in Wales, uh, in Wrexham, um, not far from where I live. This particular community buyout of the pub was also linked to um, uh, another um, purchase of the football club, the local football club. So, so the, 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 there's... Kind of, a, uh, kind of a knock-on effect. So if you have one successful community share issue, that can actually kind of inspire others to do another and another and another. And in fact, it was in the 19th century that the local cooperative societies, if you went back 100 years ago, there was, I think, somewhere like 1,600 local cooperative societies in this country. Now we've got about 40 left. But the, every, little, every area had its local cooperative society. It was part of the culture. It was promoting cooperative education. It was encouraging um, these sorts of things. So um, hopefully we'll begin to kind of begin to cultivate the, those kind of more connected approaches. What's interesting about the cooperative model as opposed to other models of organizational structure is that an organization really ultimately is a bunch of people coming together, forming a legal structure for a purpose, okay? It's, it's that pr purpose. And in the private sector world, it's, of course, the duty of making a profit for investor owners, for shareholders. That's the for-profit purpose. The non-profit purpose, and we've seen civil society organizations mushroom like mad over the last 30 years till you know, millions of, of civil society organizations exist. But their typical structure will be an NGO structure, which is really a, not a non-profit structure, and their legal structure does not enable them to have investor membership in terms of people investing in what they're doing. And their, their, their revenue tends to be from gifted income or, or for service level agreements to provide services. A cooperative organization is a not-for-profit in other words, profit isn't its objective. It can make profit, it should make profit to actually sort of be able to grow and multiply. But its uses of profit is around the reinvestment in the mission of the organization. And the mission of the cooperative organization is clear historically. It's not for profit, not for charity, but for service. That's very important to understand. So that for service mission is actually what it's about. Mary Meller, who's given one of these Earth Talks, have talked about the provisioning economy. And so the provisioning economy is very much part of this for-service mission. Um, 
Professor Carol Williams, who teaches at the University of Manchester, um, is a very interesting academic. Um, he's been doing some very interesting observations about the scale in the European Union of jobs in different sectors of the economy. But the dominant area of the growth of employment is in the services sector. And for the most part, what Professor Williams ob ob observes, not entirely, but it's most services are pretty hardwired to the, to, to the local geography. You can move some of them offshore, but for, for the most part, lots of them are actually pretty intrinsic to the locality. The provision of food, potentially, more locally. Housing, utilities, particularly if we move towards green energy. Finance, if we move towards sources of mutual finance, as the share issues are showing. Repairs, maintenance, health services really are um, intrinsically uh, a local, regional provision. Social care, education, obviously can be uh, done on the web, but often it's the relationship of the education to the practice that's critical. Advice, knowledge, transfer, etc. Renewable energy in Germany and Denmark have been hugely successful because they've moved from NGO structures, which was often the case at the beginning, to cooperative structures. Cooperative structures have enabled them to expand. And renewable energy in Germany is more than half owned by people. And it's often, it's only really through the local cooperative structure that they've been able to get planning permission and support for the wind, for the windmills and the, uh, and, and the development of renewable energy systems that in other parts of this country, people are resisting um, because the ownership is private at a distance rather than local ownership. And in Denmark, it was really the relationship between the municipalities and the cooperatives over the last 30 years that's enabled Germany in Denmark to take such a large share uh, of the renewable energy market away from big institutions, whether it's public or private, and bring it into popular control. I'll talk about that more later, but the partnership between the local government and the cooperative sector is a crucial I think, part of the solution to um, move towards a steady state economy. So where else are cooperative enterprises expanding? Globally, the figures are pretty phenomenal. Um, as a kind of latent source of trans uh, transformative power. But it is also a source of everyday power. And in some, in some countries, and I'll give you some examples in a moment, the power is pretty evident and pretty impressive. So one billion people, you know, seven billion on the planet, one billion people are members of, of, of cooperatives uh, globally. Yeah, I'm an absolute member, yeah, yeah. 15 million in the UK are members. Um, providing services globally to over 3 billion people weekly, which is quite significant. More employees who are paid than multinational corporations combined, involved in every single sector of the economy. Two thirds of farmers, just to take one example from the UK, are in agricultural co-ops. 6,000 cooperative enterprises operate in the UK, and one new co-op is setting up every day. These figures are from Cooperatives UK. And cooperative sector has been expanding since 2008 by 5% a year. So mutual aid, mutuality um, is on the up. And there are in, important, and we, we talk, Mike Lewis and I talk about this extensively in the book, there are important areas of emerging markets that are very significant for the building of a social and ecological and democratic economy. Community land trusts um, for permanently affordable housing. Um, you could actually f trace those back to the Chartists and some of the early 19th century co-ops that were doing things like this. And the Garden City movement um, was um, a very interesting one 100 years ago. But Community Land Trust for Affordable Housing in Cornwall, um, it's been very, very successful with Cornwall Community Land Trust umbrella organization, um, building houses and villages that are affordable uh, in areas where otherwise people be looking at an open market price of 300,000 pounds, you know, getting 
a home for 80,000 um, pounds, is that through a community land trust is uh, an impressive way of actually kind of making housing affordable in areas where otherwise people would have to lose, lo 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 you know, either pay ex extraordinary rents or leave. Cooperative hydropower, cooperative wind power, solar energy for community buildings, community development finance. There are now something like 75 mutually owned community loan funds in the UK. Most of those have, have been set up since 1997. I was involved in setting up one of the first ones in Birmingham in 1997. Uh, care co-ops, um, which I'll talk more about. Here's an interesting example from Wales. Uh, this is near Cardigan. Um, so Pembrokeshire Way, kind of the southwest corner of Wales. A very interesting um, Welsh-speaking guy called Chris Thomas uh, in Cardigan. Uh, he won the uh, Cooperator of the Year Award last year in Wales. And it's amazing what the leadership and he and the community have done in this particular area in and around. His village is uh, Hermine, um, and they did a share issue uh, for £50,000 in 2006 to buy a, a closed school. They've converted the building into a community centre and a bar, a pub <laughs> for the village. Um, it's an, a, an eco building, um, solar, timber framed, heat pumps, you name it, very, very ecologically developed. Uh, a complex for office space for work uh, in the village. Um, also, uh, they've developed a space for starting a village nursery. Um, they've got a conference center, diverse sources of income. That experience with a 50,000 pound share issue and not very far away is the town of Cardigan, where in the 2008 period when the economy collapsed, there was a big kind of retail development of the town, which were the, uh, some big shopping developer, shopping center developer, had bought a lot of buildings and had earmarked that for this big massive kind of shopping complex and it was redundant, all boarded up because there was no finance for it. Um, so they said, well, we can, what, what could we do? Because it was right in the heart of the town to make this particular boarded up area an amenity rather than an eyesore. Well, Chris and his colleagues decided to actually do a share issue, which they did. And so they raised a quarter, about a quarter of a million pounds uh, in, you know, in 2010 to, to bail out this failed private sector development. And they bought up in the city centre four warehouses, a cottage, two shops, and two car parks. And the car parks are being used to provide revenue income from the car parks to fund the co-op. So the co-op is able to employ people from the revenue from the car parks. So it's, it's actually kind of a very kind of clever way of actually um, using um, parking income to support the regeneration of the town. They've leveraged a bank loan of 160,000 on top of that. So basically they're, they've raised close to half a million to start this development. The other thing that they've done, which is very interesting, is of course they're developing in the village um, a community wind scheme. Um, and for uh, you know one, almost one and a half megawatt scheme, two turbines, and <laughs> their second share issue last year, they bought the, the redundant, the closed down police station and the courthouse. <laughs> so actually, here you have a cooperative town being kind of not only conceptualized, but actually materializing you know, in this great recession. It's really, really interesting, the imagination. And the confidence that was built at the village level to have a go at the town level is really, really, really hopeful. Um, not too far away uh, in the Swansea area in South Wales, um, there's another energy co-op uh, which is trying to find a way to help nonprofit organizations on their buildings reduce their 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 uh, their energy bill, particularly electricity bill, and go green. But so that the, if you like, the risk of the investment is pooled or shared, the solar co-op, the Agni Solar Co-op, is going to basically um, manage the solar panels, maintain the solar panels, put them on the roofs, raise the capital for them, and 
effectively the nonprofits are going to be renting their roof um, to, to, to get lower energy bills, um, but they'll be supporting the cooperative uh, and hopefully maybe investing in the cooperative as well to enable this scheme to develop. And this scheme has also already been developed. The, the model for this particular development is in Brixton, where um, in London, in South London, um, the co-op has been successful already in raising money, typically a 4% return with the in, in initial investment, not far off. We were looking at the average, which is around in the schemes that we looked at between 2009, 2012, being about a thousand pounds per member. So you invest a thousand pounds, tax relief comes in at 500 under the existing scheme, the enterprise investment scheme, dividends accumulated over 20 years, 800 pounds, um, the return on capital um, of a thousand. So the aggregate be between the tax relief and the dividends and the return of the initial amount um, is about 2,300 over a 20 year period. So a 4% return over that time period. Um, so the, Robin Murray will be here tomorrow, I think evening, and he, he's, he's a colleague of mine. And uh, he's been on the Welsh Commission on, um, on Cooperatives and Mutuals, which has been looking into the potential, because Wales is really the poorest country in the United Kingdom on almost all the indices. Um, can the cooperative, um, cooperative enterprise be a vehicle for the regeneration of the Welsh economy? If you look at Cardigan, you would think, well, it looks like there's every reason why not. And of course, the benefits in terms of cutting greenhouse gas emissions, reducing fuel poverty, local regeneration, attracting community investment, building democracy, building the co-op movement, solidarity, all virtuous circle. The evergreen co-ops in the United States point to an urban model to do this on a bigger scale in a big city. How many people here have heard of Evergreen? A few? Okay. Um, anyway, they've looked at the, the model uh, of the Mondragon cooperatives in the Basque Country um, to see if they could adopt um, that successful um, Spanish-based model uh, for, um, for um, this city um, in, in, the, in the industrial heartland of the United States, um, which has lost so many jobs over the last 30 years because of deindustrialization, jobs going to other countries uh, and parts of the American South where labor was cheaper and there weren't trade unions to kind of fight for a living wage. So they've developed partnerships um, in the city by an interesting proposition. They've said, look, this is a city that was once proud, you know, one and a half million people, it's lost half its population. Do you want it to continue to lose population and end up being like Detroit, which has lost more than half its population? Um, and so many areas are abandoned and vacant and, um, and, and, you know, the economy is actually just going down and down and down. How could we reverse that? Do you have pride in Cleveland? How can we express that pride? And well, they felt, well, who are the organizations that really cannot leave Cleveland or not very easily leave Cleveland? And could they be the anchor organizations to support the upturn and the improvement of Cleveland and to put confidence and pride back? So they put the pitch of investing Cleveland for, for the better good and invest in a green Cleveland, an evergreen Cleveland, to the, the city, which um, was an obvious place to start, but to the universities, to the hospitals, to other public institutions, to the community foundations. And they managed to raise $200 million into a revolving fund. And they were going, the, the idea was to use that fund as very, very patient capital to invest in worker cooperatives to make Cleveland a better place in the industries of the 21st century the green economy industries. So they've created a series of, uh, with a, you know, a sizable revolving fund uh, to start with um, um, in solar energy installation, in local food enterprises, in low carbon state-of-the-art laundry for the hospitals, uh, green laundry, 
Um, they've invested in the, the, the development of the, the largest urban farm in the United States, which is wind power heated greenhouse of 3.5 acres under glass, another seven acres outside, growing annually under glass, three million heads of lettuce and 500 tons of herbs. They looked at the carbon footprint to see that most of, virtually all the herbs and all the lettuce were being trucked in from California and Florida, either 1,500 miles away or 2,000 plus miles away. So this is what it looks like. So they've got these consortium of, of cooperatives growing food. And the installations of the solar panels, their first customers were the anchor institutions. So they were doing big installations on university buildings, on city buildings, you know, on hospitals, so that the labor force, mostly Afri Afri -Caribbean, or Afri African American, that was unemployed uh, in the city, were given the opportunity to learn these particular skills. And with the anchor institutions funding both the skill learning and the volume, be able to take the solar installations to individual homes which is the second phase of the program. So they're kick-starting a green economy. And when they looked at the institutions that were the anchor ones that they identified as being, if you like, the social capitalists for this green revolution, the annual procurement of those in institutions is over three billion US dollars a year. So the potential for these institutions to actually drive this new green economy, strategically, is really there. You can see the potential for this to actually really work. And now, because Cleveland's doing it, Atlanta's interested, Los Angeles, Oakland, California, um, a number of US cities are looking to this model as a way of moving to the green economy, not only in the United States, also in Europe, um, because it's such an interesting, impressive, imaginative start. Um, a very interesting book that I would highly recommend you to read. It's only been produced a few months ago. Uh, Gar Alperwitz has wrote a book called What Then Must We Do? It's only 150 pages. It reads like a train. You know, it's like, if you, yeah, if you like kind of crime and thrillers, well, this is a kind of a, a, a nonfiction thriller, I think, actually. It's about how we might improve the world. He calls it um, an agenda for e evolutionary e reconstruction. Gar Alpovitz is in his 70s now. He's very spry. If you actually do the Google and you, you, you kind of look up the book, there's, a, there's a, like a 15-minute kind of tele uh, television, U.S. television interview with him, where, which is quite, quite compelling. Anyway, to give you the rundown briefly is that it's a long road. It's a building the democratic road as we travel, as I've described it as my talk tonight. And he looks at it in terms of can we, in an evolutionary economic way, reconstruct uh, you know, industrial economies that are actually kind of, uh, you know, kind of past their sell-by date to, to develop uh, postmodern um, uh, ecological economies? And how would we do that? Historically, uh, of course, you have to look at the political agenda. What is the, where are the votes and where is the political support for what should we do? Um, trade union power in the United States has declined. Only about 12% of American workers are in trade unions. But on the other hand, the, the numbers of people in cooperatives has grown and grown and grown. So four in 10 Americans are in co-ops, 130 million members in the United States. And so, he looks to find a way of engaging in a progressive constituency, um, the trade unions uh, on the green jobs agenda, the co-op members and the municipalities in this progressive popular front. So he sees this as a paradigm shift um, which is centered on democratic ownership. So cooperatives and employee share ownership plans and also municipal ownership is, uh, is critical to the strategy, but also 
a checkerboard strategy. So you're trying to find a way of getting up the chessboard or the checkerboard um, by actually finding places like Cleveland to actually inspire one move, another move, another move, and then you may maybe do three moves, right? Um, so it, it, it is, uh, you know, let's walk the talk, let's show what can be done, let's demonstrate uh, the potential, and let's try to get other people to follow the early adopters. Uh, but we will require patient capital. Um, we will require probably public banking and mutual banking structures to provide and mobilize the social investment to enable this to be achieved. And he calls the agenda the pluralist commonwealth agenda. Let's look at the care sector. Uh, so shifting from kind of environmental care to social care here. The situation at the moment in this country, and I dare say other countries, but I got the figures on this country because I'm currently doing the research, um, is absolutely disgraceful, to say the least. I mean, people have been jailed um, recently in Bristol for... Um, the, the, the neglect of, of people in care. Um, people have died in care uh, circumstances. Um, Southern Cross was a bit, very big offshore funded uh, private sector organization which took over a huge number of care homes and it went basically bust in 2011. 750 care homes had to be basically rescued by government intervention. Um, and that was a huge uh, failure. Um, but the insolvencies in the care sector are rife, um, and, it, it, and the number of insolvencies is growing. So there's 35 insolvencies in 2010. Last year, um, there were 73, so it doubled in two-year period. Um, the residential care home debt is over $4 billion outstanding. The Care Quality Commission did an inspection of care homes in 2012 and found that the majority failed the minimum kind of standards of, 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 of service performance. Um, and the pay is as, is as rock bottom as you can find it. It's Dickensian pay circumstances. 150,000 to 220,000, that's the range that, that the research estimates of people who are carers are paid below the minimum wage, uh, which is not legal, but it, they get away with it because they don't pay people for traveling because they're doing home care you know, from one job to the next job. So basically that time isn't paid. So they're ending up, they get minimum wage, but then they, they have all this unpaid travel time um, that they have to kind of um, do for free. And we've seen the transformation over the last 20 years of the care sector from the pub, largely public sector uh, employed um, workforce to 83% now in the private sector. 10% still in the voluntary sector, and 7% with local authorities. But on top of the 434,000 people who are paid to provide care in the country, there are more than, nine, more than 10 times that number. 6.3 million people are unpaid carers. So what Charles Eisenstein was talking about in terms of the unpaid and the paid, it's important to see the relationship between the two as a potential way of considering a reconceptualization, a reconstruction of how, how care might be provided under a new model, under a cooperative model. And that's what I want to talk about. Here's an interesting way that we could do it and that is being experimented with successfully in Maine, in rural areas in the New England part of the United States. So, they have, as you can see, the paid professionals here at the bottom providing personal care. But they realize in the conceptualization of elder power that there is this 10 to 1 or 12 to 1 or 15 to 1 number of people who are unpaid, friends, family members, and so on, who are providing care. So what they've been developing is a social currency to actually kind of bring that gifted labor into the delivery through a cooperative that linked with the paid labor and is, is structured in a, in, a, in a creative way to actually kind of enable a full service to somebody who's, who needs care to be provided for. So it builds community, it builds networks, it, it, it builds social capital, it uses the social currency which is supported in Maine 
by the local cinemas, the local restaurants, the petrol stations. So they agreed to take the social currency for real goods and services so you can spend the money for caring in the real economy. Um, it's actually creating solidarity amongst the business community and the public services in Maine for this particular model. And it's using modern IT to actually, you know, to manage this process in a co-production way that links co-production of time, the paid money economy is a part, and the mobilization of social capital is building democracy and community development. So that's the kind of, if you like, experimental action, which is something that I think we could build upon. We do have a number of care co-ops in the UK, some of which have been fair, pretty successful. So here's just the care co-ops in Brighton is over 20 years old, working to provide services to those with learning disabilities and people with mental health uh, issues. The Regan Home Care Co-op is right in the middle of the country, north of Birmingham and Telford, which has been going over 20 years. Sunderland Home Care, Care Co-op in the um, in the in near Newcastle on Tyne in the northeast of England, has been very successful, and they've now got a franchise for their model called Casa Home which is um, being taken up increasingly because the service has been so successful. The foster care co-op started by a colleague of mine. It started um, in England and now it's developed in Scotland. It's moving into Wales. Um, it's been hugely successful. And the co-op, one of the bit larger cooperative societies, the Mid-Counties Co-op, has supported childcare um, since 2011. And they've developed really successful childcare co-op model in 46 six different parts of the country. So there are a number of models. There's a model here in um, North Lincolnshire, which was um, a kind of a community buyout of something that was a pr going to be a privatized health service, community health service in involving midwives and a number of community district nurses. And they've created a co-op, effectively a co-op, uh, social enterprise of 750 workers. And there are a few of those bigger ones around. So, so there is quite a lot of you know, new or um, long-standing activity, good practice that we can build upon. If we want to create a cooperative economy, if we want to move from a viciously competitive economy, an economy that pays people you know, kind of just you know, unacceptable levels of low wages, then we actually have to change the way the system works. This is a professor who, um, um, who ha had some involvement with Yugoslavia, anyway, he migrated to the States, and, um, and he said, he's interesting, said, he said, co-ops in the West are a bit like seawater fish in a freshwater pond. They're in the wrong, the wrong water, that's the problem. They have to find their way from a lake to the Pacific Ocean. Um, the capitalist world in the last 200 years has evolved its own institutions, instruments, political frameworks. Economic democracy or cooperative democracy we're talking about requires democratic institutions and infrastructure to do the same. So in other words, there's no, you, can, you, know, you can't survive in a capitalist sea. That You actually have to s s create cooperative oceans. And in cooperative oceans, um, you can actually create the ambient conditions for the cooperative economy, the peace economy of the future, to actually not only survive, but thrive and expand. So that's our challenge. Um, it, and it's back to what Gar Alpovitz was saying about evolutionary reconstruction, I think. So the pluralist commonwealth has to be something that we actually have to plan and imagine and kind of crowd develop in some way. Otherwise, it seems to me, um, you know, the isolation is, is going to mean that groups are going to starve for lack of oxygen, um, or they th simply won't, won't thrive. Um, they'll be very anemic. So the challenge, both from a policy perspective, from a theoretical perspective, from a practice perspective, is to develop cooperative networks that enable this kind of new environment to be created. That's a big task. But there are ways of doing it, and this is what I wanted to finish on in terms of kind of sharing with you some of the ways that this has been done elsewhere. So in Italy has developed systems for cooperative organizations that are autonomous to actually become interdependent. 
Um, and they've done this through different ways of organizing the structure and developing a shared narrative, um, building on common values and principles, and developing common systems of finance. And the heart of this work has been evolving in Emilia Romana, which is a, um, a province in the north of Italy. Bologna is the, is, is the main town. Wouldn't you like to be there now in that sunshine? So it's a cooperative model, um, and it's interesting that in this particular town, 75% of the population are in co-op, so they've got a density uh, of, of value and, and commitment to the business model. 8,000 cooperatives alone in the region. It's the region in Europe with the highest density of cooperatives, I think probably in the world, maybe uh, um, rivals uh, the, uh, the Mondragon uh, model in, in, that, in the Basque country, but very dense um, and has been evolving really since the Second World War. And they account for something like 40% of GDP in the region, which is incredible. Um, and interestingly, uh, because, uh, like for example, the Mondragon cooperatives practice this principle and the, the original principle, and it's varied a bit, is that the, the, the maximum income and the minimum income should not vary in a cooperative by more than five to one. Um, uh, and, 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 it's, and it's where you have cooperatives that practice that fair pay, play and the, that kind of the, the, the disparity between the, the, you know, the, the, the chief and the Indians is not too vast, um, that um, you get impact. In this particular case, Emilia Romana also happens to be the region of Europe with the lowest social economic inequality. So that's not just coincidental. And it's this highly integrated networks amongst the cooperatives across sectors, both vertically and horizontally, um, that shows you the power of a systems approach. Now, how did it start? Well, in some ways, it didn't start dissimilarly to what was happening in the late 70s and the early 80s here in the UK. At that time, you had stagflation after the OPEC oil crisis. You had lots of unemployment. Unemployment rose from a couple hundred thousand to three million over a few, you know, short period of time. There was a funding crisis of the state. That was also happening in the UK. It was happening in many European countries. Um, and in this particular part of Italy, um, they supported the development of cooperatives, not just in social care, but in a lot of other sectors as well. Uh, and in the social care area, um, the, the, they wanted to find a way of um, developing um, uh, care services in a cooperative manner, um, but they also wanted to do that to create employment with people who were otherwise disadvantaged in the labor market, uh, homeless people, people with drug addiction problems, people uh, otherwise with substance abuse, um, uh, battered women, um, people who been in prison, um, refugees, a whole host of people there, there, there was a side could, could be create uh, employment. So in particular areas, particularly uh, Emilia Romana, but also Lombardy, Trentino, uh, these are other provinces in northern Italy, this collaborative partnership model evolved. And <clears throat> different groups support it in different ways. So you had Catholics supporting it as a solidarity model, but also you had people in the Communist Party and the left supporting it. So, and even some liberals were supporting it. So it did get this kind of cross political support. But what was interesting about it in terms of the social cooperatives is that they wanted to experiment with a model that united the workers, the volunteers, so the paid workers, the volunteers, the service users in a multi-stakeholder model. And the first one was established actually in 1963 in Brescia, um, not to the east of Milan, Milano. <clears throat> so how do they operate? I'm sharing with you this model because it has been spreading to other countries, so it's beginning to migrate out of Italy. But in Italy, it's been most successfully developed so far. So the idea is that the, the guiding principles are that the service design should be done by involving service users, workers, volunteers, family members in the development of the social cooperative that they followed the kind of idea of Schumacher, small is beautiful, by trying to actually keep the cooperatives human scale. 
So the maximum size of the membership of the cooperative ideally should not be more than 100, so that the, the, the human scale and the relationship is maximized by that kind of, uh, kind of you, 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 you can know each other. This is a kind of a more of a um, Gemeinschaft level than Gesellschaft level of kind of organization. People could actually know each other um, on a first name basis. And in fact, it's worked. The typical size of a, co uh, uh, of, of a social co op to this day, and the, the numbers are pretty impressive, is about 30 paid worker members plus other volunteers and other service users. Um, and that maximizes the democratic accountability aspect. So, and so they're very locally based. Um, it's a decentralized model. And interestingly, they chose as the, as the model from the, from the Beatles, Strawberry Fields. So they had this idea, well, Strawberry Fields forever, what would that look like? Well, it would look like that every social cooperative that's established has a social obligation to start another one. So just as like a strawberry plant puts out a runner, each social cooperative is responsible to put out another and, and clone itself. So then it just migrates this way and you get this lattice effect. And that's actually really happened. But to support that happening, they needed to gr develop these supporting structures, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the other thing they were concerned about was the opposition that they might otherwise face from the trade unions and the public sector in terms of pay. So they spent a number of years having a dialogue with the different trade unions in Italy to say, well, we're not going to poach jobs from the public sector. We're not going to try to take um, you know, those jobs out of the public sector. We're trying to develop something that's complementary in terms of the needs. And they signed, after a number of years of hard bargaining, a national agreement but also to pay um, a, a decent wage. So how does it work? Well, typically this is something that uh, uh, gives you an idea. So you have in the membership these different stakeholders. So you have service users, carers and families, paid staff, and amongst those carers and families and friends, you'll have uh, volunteers, and so there's a mix. And those stakeholders become members. They elect the board of directors. The board of directors supervises the cooper cooperative manager. And then, of course, this, the, the staff. Um, the first 10 years, there was an experimental period. And it was mainly you know, trying this, trying that, and so on and so forth. But they developed about 2,000 cooperatives, social cooperatives, between the late 70s and 1989 ish. Then they started lobbying for legislation because they thought if we really wanted to expand what, what was beginning, beginning to become successful, we needed to have a supportive legislative environment that would enable this to develop. So they negotiated through the new legislation that was passed in 1991 a lower rate of corporation tax because of the nature of the work um, and the social inclusion, an exemption from national insurance contributions which for the type B cooperatives, which were working with the most disadvantaged people, um, people with um, substance abuse, ex-offenders, um, people otherwise hard to employ, were type B social co-op, the type A were more the kind of home care co-op. So they differentiated in the legislation the types, and they got additional tax relief for that particular type of co-op. There was a lower value-added value tax, which is 21% today. 4% was, is the rate that they pay, although that is expected to go up next year to 10% because of austerity. Um, tax release for donors to social co-ops, so you get a tax benefit to, for either gifting capital or, or investing. You can invest in solidarity bonds for specific initiatives. Um, also, the trading surpluses are not taxed if they're put in the capital reserves of the co-op. And they've developed a special set of banking relationships. For example, the Banca Popolare Etica, the ethical bank in Italy, the, the popular ethical bank, was actually a bank that was developed. You know, the, co the, the social cooperatives were very active in the development of that bank in the 1990s. And so the new social co-ops um, get equity loans at, uh, to help them 
um, expand, and also uh, loans of 3,000 um, pounds injection, uh, 3,000 euros injection for each new worker. And there's also a special different funds that solidarity funds like the Marconi Fund is one example that actually provide capital um, that's patient for the development of these organizations. One important model to understand is that, okay, you've got a very decentralized, localized set of cooperatives. How can you possibly manage to have small cooperatives enable them to compete with big contracts? Well, the way this is done is that behind the individual um, social cooperative, you have a secondary cooperative, which is called a, a consortia. And the consortia does things like maybe administration, paying wages, training, um, regulatory issues, um, supervision of regulatory matters, help with IT. You know, a lot of back office functions is shared in the different regions. Um, so, um, and tendering for contracts and things like that can be done by one consortia on be behalf of several hundred social cooperatives. You know, so um, you get economies of scale to the secondary cooperative that's actually um, uh, joined at the hip with the, with the individual cooperatives. So it's a network governance model um, that they've developed. And equally, they can get preferential investment by um, putting money into a mutual insurance fund, these mutual guarantee societies, which enable them to put money and get a lower cost investment, let's say, from a cooperative bank loan. So they've developed systems to support um, the development of the movement, including a national consor consor consortia um, for doing research and development and advocacy at the national level um, for the movement. So these are just some figures uh, to finish off on what it looks like today. So we're looking at a movement in Italy that's grown from a couple of hundred uh, co-ops uh, in the, in the mid-80s or in the early 80s uh, to 14,500, uh, now employing 360,000 paid workers, 40,000 disadvantaged paid workers, um, over 31,000 volunteers on an active basis, 57% growth since 2005, and they now have more people in the social cooperative sector than in the nonprofit sector in Italy. So the model has been transformative in terms of um, its, 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 its period of um, development. And service provision for almost 5 million people and an annual turnover of 9 billion euro. And they've developed a very interesting fair trade aspect. So for example, there are now social co-ops working with often people who are leaving prison uh, in vineyards, developing fair trade wine, which you see in different parts of Europe, um, um, on former mafia land. <laughs> um, and Saluzzo Prison in Torino has developed a pub in the prison, I mean a brewery, in the prison. And that particular real ale is not only kind of, you know, exported and popular across Italy, but it's exported internationally as real ale. Yeah? Yeah? And what you mean, what the people in prison, the, the you know, statistics in any country you look at, people who leave prison, 70% like of them, you know, end up back in prison because nobody will employ them, you know. So what they're doing is that they're actually creating jobs in the prison. So, for example, this Paza Cafe, which is a... Um, <laughs> it's a coffee chain, you know, it's like expanding and competing with the likes of Starbucks. It's cooperatively owned, but the coffee beans and the chocolate and all the ingredients for the shops is produced in the prisons. And then when people come out, then they work in the, in the coffee bars, right? So it's kind of both in and out of the prison. They're developing these co social cooperative pathways to enable people to kind of get their confidence back and, you know, and, and uh, participate in the workforce. It's quite amazing. Uh, movement. Now, legislation has been passed in a number of other countries to duplicate this. France in 2004, Poland in 2003, Spain, Portugal, Hungary, Quebec in 1997, 
uh, I've been doing the research with Co-ops UK to try to introduce this particular model to complement the existing care model, which is more of a worker co-op model, to introduce a multi-stakeholder model here um, in England and Wales. But interestingly, last point, is in, 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 in Quebec, they've expanded the model. They call it something different. They call it solidarity cooperatives. And it applies to not just the... In, in Italy, the, the social cooperatives work in the care sector, the social services sector, health services and education. But the Quebecois were so impressed with the model that they've expanded it to the whole social economy. So it includes the environmental sector, it includes kind of ecotourism, it, could, it includes housing, it includes... And the Quebec law, which was 1997, what they're finding is that basically something like six to seven new co-ops setting up in Quebec are set, setting up as multi-stakeholder solidarity co-ops because the model seems to be robust and resilient and attractive for, um, for any service, any part of the economy. That's very interesting indeed. So not only is it a model for the social care sector, it's a model for the environmental care sector big time, in my humble view. So, uh, so it's very, very impressive indeed, and I think that's it for me, and over to you. Thanks.